Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to MCBS Chronicle Series. My name is uh, Saeed Al-Kitani. I am the Associate Dean for Arabic Academic Programs uh, at the College, and uh, I'm going to be the moderator of this session today. Uh, today we've got to know uh, Dr. Jeff Rose. He's our guest speaker. And Dr. Jeff Rose is an archaeologist and anthropologist specializing in the prehistory of Southwest Asia. He received his PhD in anthropology from uh, Southern Methodist University. Currently, he is a research scholar at the Ronin Institute. Uh, since 2000, uh, Dr. Jeff has directed the archaeological fieldwork campaigns in Yemen and Oman. He was presented the Lifetime Achievement title of National uh, Geographic Explorer in uh, 2012 and uh, he is an uh, award-nominated science and religion presenter appearing in a documentary series for BBC, uh, National Geographic, Discovery Science, uh, PBS, and other TV channels. Uh, our topic today is uh, Oman in the time before time. Very interesting topic, and I would like to introduce uh, this topic by quoting uh, Yuval Harari in his uh, book, A Brief History of Humankind, uh, talking about uh, prehistoric humans. Uh, he says, and I quote him, these archaic humans loved, played, formed close friendships, and competed for status and power, but so did chimpanzees, baboons, and elephants. There was nothing special about humans, nobody least of all humans themselves had any kind, uh, any inkling that their descendants would one day walk on the moon, split the atom, uh, fathom the genetic code, and write history books. The most important thing to know about uh, prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no more impact on their environment than gorillas uh, fireflies and jellyfish. This is what you know uh, Harari says in his book, and we would like today to see you know, listen to the theory of uh, Dr. Jeff Rose about you know prehistoric uh, humans. Uh, Dr. Jeff, the floor is yours now. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Said, for that introduction. Um, actually, I would request a second seminar series, if, if that's okay, just to address that quote that you read, <laughs> because the, that 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 question is really it's at the heart of what of everything that we do within the field of paleoanthropology, archaeology, is trying to understand what makes us human, what makes us different, um, and and to some degree we can address that through the archaeology of Oman. So I'll I'll try. Uh, that's a bit deep to get into right away, but I'll try at least just to start. Um, to give everyone out there a flavor of, of just how incredible the, the prehistoric heritage is of the Sultanate of Oman and just how much we've learned over the past two decades uh, from, from what we've been finding out in the desert. Uh, so before I get started, I just uh, want to welcome everyone that's, that's joining both of, in Oman and internationally. And, um, and just to say thank you to, to Dr. Saeed and to, to everybody who's organizing this. Um, for inviting me and giving me the chance to to talk about my research, which is um, my obviously my favorite subject to talk about. So um, the title of the talk today is Oman in the Time Before Time. And this is a bit of a play on words because what I'm really talking about is early human prehistory. And the difference between prehistory and history is whether we were writing things down, whether we were keeping track of time, whether we were archiving our own past, uh, so what I'm talking about today is the entire stretch of, of human emergence, of human evolution from about a million years ago until about 5,000 years ago. So there's quite a bit of ground to cover in 45, 50 minutes. I'll do my best to keep us going fast enough so that we have some time for questions at the end. Um, Dr. Jeff, before you start, I would like just to invite our you know, uh, attendees you know, to uh, write any question they have in the space that you dedicated for, you know, a Q and A in this platform, and we are going to address this question at the end of, you know, 
Dr. Jeff, you know, uh, intervention. Go ahead. Please, yes, that, that, that should probably be the best part of this, uh, is not the presentation itself, but, but getting to talk to everyone at the end and getting to, to answer questions and have a discussion about some of the topics that I raised. And I'm intentionally trying to be controversial in some parts, so um, uh, I hope people don't mind me trying to poke things up a little bit. So I wanted to start with this quote, uh, because this quote, it's near and dear to my heart. This is what originally brought me to the Arabian Peninsula, to Southern Arabia. When I was, I read this in graduate school. This is from a, a travel account of Sijin Filby, who was one of the first Western explorers to cross the Rubal Kali, the great sand sea of, of Southern Arabia. And in his travel account, he, tra he crossed it in the winter of 1929-1930. And in his account, he says, my attention was attracted as we marched by a white object. In a moment, I had called a halt, and for the next two hours, the whole party was busy collecting freshwater shells, not from an immense deposit, and not only shells, but a lot, a splendid lot of high quality, beautiful flint implements of ancient man. And this quote really summarizes everything I'm about to talk about in, in, in my presentation. It's a lake, remnants of an ancient lake in the middle of the desert. Now, I took this picture myself. Uh, a few years ago, I was doing some work, some, some survey work out in the Rubal Kali, and I almost jumped out of the car while it was still going. I was so excited to see this. What we're looking at here is this white flat thing is an ancient lake deposit. It's called marl, and it's made up of, of ancient concreted carbonates. And what's, what's sitting on top of it is a sand dune. And this, this kind of symbolizes the Arabian Peninsula. So we have today this, this for the most part, arid peninsula covered in sand, covered in, in barren rock, sitting on top uh, of a land that was once green and lush. And, and just like this quote says, there are flint implements, ancient stone tools of, of early humans scattered around these, these deposits. So Arabia to me is the, is the quintessential lost world. Um, and within it is the, what I would argue is the missing chapter in the prehistory of our species. And we can really only understand who we are by understanding what happened in the Arabian Peninsula over the course of, of human evolution. So it's an immensely important place. And as I'll argue as we go along, South Arabia in particular. So we call this, this paradigm, this, this, this way of seeing Arabia, green Arabia. The idea is that throughout geological history over the course of the last uh, millions of years before humans were, were even around, Arabia fluctuated between desert and green, desert and green. And so what we're looking at here are two different maps, two different extremes. So presently we're in a dry period and most of the peninsula gets 100, 1 to 100 or 100 to 200 millimeters of rainfall, which is, is very small. And you have some small pockets that still get a bit of rain, but, but for the most part, it is an arid to hyper-arid climatic regime. Occasionally in the past, and this is associated with fluctuations in temperatures around the world, occasionally Arabia turned green. There's a monsoon that is cycling through the Indian Ocean, and that monsoon would have intensified every so often and been drawn into the interior of the peninsula. So on the right-hand side, what we're looking at is Arabia when that monsoon was, was depositing rainfall throughout the interior, and it's up to 300 to 600 meters, millimeters of rainfall. In the Yemeni highlands, um, 600 to 1,000 millimeters of rainfall. So it's, it's almost subtropical in parts. And during these periods, Arabia flourished, and it, it was entirely transformed. And so that lake that I showed you would have formed in one of these periods. Now, this isn't just a historical artifact. The, the idea of green Arabia is still alive and today. There is still part of Arabia that's green, and that's the southern part of Oman, the region called Dhofar. And I took this picture flying over. I just got lucky on one of these flights down to Salala, which is the capital city of Dhofar, and we just flew over the rainfall divide. So what we're looking at is the absolute limit uh, of the monsoon, the present limit of the monsoon. And this is just here, I'm showing you uh, on the right on this map, just here at the, at the edge of these mountains. Um, and this is at the end of the monsoon season. So the monsoon, for, for Omanis, you all know this, but for, for anyone who's watching internationally, the monsoon occurs from the end of June to the beginning of September. 
And during that time, the temperatures drop to 25 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, Celsius during the day, which is about 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is quite pleasant compared to the rest of the peninsula. And you get uh, in parts 200 millimeters, 300 millimeters of rainfall, and it supports this green landscape up until a certain point. And in this case, you can see what happens. So everything on the south side of this line is, is grassland, uh, has, has flowing water, cows, goats, camels, is full of life. And then everything on the north side is dry, barren, rocky desert. And I just for those who, who've never seen this before, who are just seeing it for the first time, this is so far during the monsoon season. And you would be hard pressed to know if you just dropped onto this landscape that you're even in the Arabian Peninsula. And it's, it's not a land of, ca of, of camels, it's a land of cows. And this, you can see there's flowing water and waterfalls, and it is just absolutely a gorgeous place. Uh, everyone during the monsoon season, everyone flocks to Dofar just to be able to get out of the heat and into the rainfall. So it is, it's a special place. And for our purposes today, it's really important because it's the last living vestige of what had been uh, a phenomenon that affected the entire peninsula. So why does this happen? Well, it happens because of something called the intertropical convergence zone, a uh, fancy term we call it the ITCZ. Now the ITCZ, ITCZ is the, the interface between two weather systems. So you have this cool air, this high pressure system that happens over the Indian Ocean. And that comes into, um, comes into, into contact with this low pressure, superheated air that is rising up above the deserts of Arabia. And when those two temperature gradients come in contact, you get wind blowing from the, from, the, from the water into the interior and it brings humid air. And then when that humid air um, rises up to the mountains, it deposits rainfall. Now in the, so this is, this is the top showing the current extent of the ITCZ, which you saw in that last slide, that rainfall divide. This is the ITCZ during the wet periods. And you can see it's going all the way into the interior. So this, this Rubal Kali, the empty quarter, which is all down here in the southern half of the peninsula, this was the land of a thousand lakes and rivers and grasslands. Now, this didn't just happen once or twice. This happened repeatedly. What I'm showing you is the last 400,000 years of human history. So on this is the x-axis. So on this side is is way back when, and this is zero, this is modern times. And you can see uh, there's several different proxy signals that are showing us this. The easiest one to look at here is temperature, so this red line. So you can see every time this red line spikes up, for instance, 330,000 years ago, things get warm, things get wet, rain start to fall across the interior of Arabia. Here's another one at about 240,000 years ago. The most important one in the history of modern humans happens 125,000 years ago, this right here. And you can see that this is actually the most pronounced, uh, this wet period right here. And then about 10,000 years ago, there was another one uh, during what's called the Neolithic period, during the New Stone Age, when Arabia turned green again. And at the moment, the, the line has dropped off. So we're, we're now back into a dry period. So this is almost, uh, I refer to this as the heartbeat of the earth. Um, this is this is not only affecting the Arabian Peninsula; it's affecting the Sahara, uh, it's affecting the, the Rajasthan in northern India. So this this arid belt that runs from from Morocco all the way to to India, um, all of this land episodically becomes green and lush, and, and this has a, a dramatic effect on the history of our species. So every time this happens, the the, the life of the Arabian Peninsula gets turned back on again. And so, for instance, we have giant straight tusked elephants called Peleoxodon reki that are roaming around the interior. They just found a couple of weeks ago, some of you might have seen in the news, uh, they found footprints of, of these Peleoxodon in Saudi Arabia from 125,000 years ago, from that recent wet period. We have longhorned buffalo, Pelorovus antiguus, um, which are First of all, a great meal for probably several weeks, if not months for early human hunter gatherers, but it's also a testament to how much grassland there was to be able to support this kind of life, uh, to support these creatures of this size and these, these 
savannah ungulates, they're called. Um, you have quite a bit. And then you have this guy, Bos primogenius, wild cattle. This is the ancestor of all our domesticated cattle today. And it, this is also a major part of our story later on because we don't know where cows were domesticated, but it looks like it was somewhere between Yemen, Oman, the Gulf region, and Southern Mesopotamia. So the fact that there are these wild cattle in the Arabian Peninsula are extremely important for understanding this question. Well, where, where do our modern cows all come from? Where does this, the, the, the domesticated variant? Now we know humans came in contact with these animals because we have rock art showing us. This is a, a famous rock art site in Saudi. And you can see there are early humans. This is from the Neolithic period, so from about 8,000 years ago, we estimate. And you've got humans hunting with bows and arrows. And these, remember I talked about these long-horned buffalo. Well, there is the long-horned buffalo depicted on the rock art panel. Not to mention you have cheetah. And another part of the panel, you have Arabian leopard. You have lions. So to have these apex predators, means there's a lot of life to support them. And nowadays, these, these apex, uh, there's, the Arabian leopard is still around in Arabia, but it's only in Dofar, only in this one green region in the south. Also on a side note, we have on a leash, these are the possibly the earliest depictions of domesticated dogs. This is a, a, a species called a breed called Canaanian, uh, from which the modern Salukis are, are derived. You can tell from these curled tails. So, um, not only were they domesticating cattle, but they were domesticating dogs. So this whole area, the area that is most significant for, in my research, and in, in what I would argue is most significant in, in early human evolution, are these canyon lands, these South Arabian canyon lands. So this was the area I'm showing you here that was getting the full brunt of that monsoon. So every time that monsoon would gather in intensity, instead of just falling over Dofar, which is this little bit right here, it was falling over, whoops, it was falling over this entire region, the Hadramaut Valley in Yemen. And you can see all of these wadis, all of these dry canyons. So today there are these deep in, uh, incised canyons that all flow north. They all flow into the Rubal Kali because the Rubal Kali is, is, a, is a depression. This is why the sand is there now. It's been filling and filling over, over tens of thousands of years with sand. Um, but at the time, all of these wadis were flowing year round and were flowing into the Rubal Kali. So that lake I showed you right at the beginning of this talk would have been formed. It would have been fed by these wadis that are flowing into the Rubal Kali. So this area more than anything else, and, and just you can see it um, clear as day just from this, this exaggerated topographic relief map, you can see how much water had been there. And if I just looking up close at one of these wadi systems. So these snake across the plateau and they, and they cut into this limestone. And in this case, this is um, uh, the Wadi Aydin in, uh, in Western Dofar. And it's about a kilometer across, so about half a mile across and about a hundred meters deep. This is the size of the Nile. And there's not just one of them, but there are if you're starting in Yemen, there are hundreds of these wadis. So there is a tremendous amount of water that is flowing. And they even, they still occasionally flow to this day. In 2018, Southern Oman was hit by a cyclone, Makunu, and all of the wadi systems filled up at that point, and they were flowing for about a week. Uh, so, so even now, they still become activated every once in a while. And in the past, during these wet periods, these would have been perennial rivers. Now, the other aspect of, of Southern Arabia, and in particular Dofar, that makes this region so attractive for, for early human hunter-gatherers is the flint. So we call it the Stone Ages, and we would not have gotten very far without stone. Now, you can't just knock any rocks together to make a stone tool. You need something very specific. You need something that breaks like glass, that is hard and sharp, and this is flint. Uh, there are a few other types, but flint is the highest quality that, that you can ask for, for, for early humans. And this is what, what Dofar and, and all of Southern Arabia has in spades. There are flint outcrops all over the place. And, and part of what makes it so attractive as well, if you go back and, and, and let me just imagine these rivers are cutting 
down into the limestone. And this is happening over long periods of time, over tens of thousands of years. But every time they cut into this limestone, they're exposing new fresh flint outcrops, which is what we're looking at here, a fresh flint outcrop that's coming straight out of the ground. Now, old flint is not so attractive. Old flint that's been lying out on the surface becomes brittle, um, shatters easily, is not so easy to control when you're making your stone tools. Whereas fresh flint, is is ideal for making stone tools. So and, and early humans knew this. They were intelligent enough to to understand the the physical properties of the raw material of the flint. So they were they were targeting these places. So what we find all across um, from from Dofar all the way up into central Oman are vast outcrops. We call these workshop sites. So everything you are looking at in this image has been uh, removed. Has been um, created by humans and is waste products in the process of making the stone tool. So we call this chipping debris or debitage is another word. So this is a, just a vast carpet of debitage that is uh, up to 10 centimeters thick full of garbage, full of, of refuse. And it was visited over and over and over again over the course of a million years by various uh, human and pre-human populations. This is another one of those, and, and I wouldn't say every piece, but let's say about 70, 75 percent of the of the pieces here on this, these black rocks on the surface are are manufactured by humans, were chipped away by humans. Now, this isn't necessarily where they would have lived. This is not a, a habitation site, but this is a workshop where they would have gone. They would have created their, their tools, presumably for hunting, for processing animal hides. And you can see we're, we're just overlooking a, a wadi canyon here. So you would have had flowing water beneath them. You would have animals moving up and down these wadis they could have kept an eye on. So this is the setting for, for a human activity site in, in the prehistoric periods. These landscapes are pristine. And this is one of the other aspects that is, is so special about Oman and about Southern Arabia that makes this place so unique is that there haven't been historic civilizations that have come in and, and built settlements and disturbed these landscapes. For the most part, when we pick up these, these artifacts, we're the first people touching these in tens of thousands of years since they were deposited in the ground, which means in a lot of cases, you can, you can put it all back together again, which is what we're doing in this picture. So you can, you can take all of those waste products and refit what are called flakes and blades, the, the chipping debris, you can refit them back onto the core, which is the, the starting point. So here is a, a completely refit core with all of the debris put back on top and all that's missing are the central bits. So this, these bits in the middle, and the reason they're missing is because that's what the, the, the tool makers took with them. That's what they wanted. Everything else they left behind. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the various types of, of stone tools we find. And it's probably a, a bit strange to, to, to think about stone tool technology as advanced technology. This is typically what's considered the most primitive type of technology. But this was all we had for over a million years. And over the course of a million years, we, we evolved through several different types of technology. So my job is not necessarily to look at the tools, but to look at the, the, the waste products that came off and to understand how did tool makers manufacture their artifacts? How did they manufacture these different types of tools? And that in itself is culturally transmitted behavior. So it's not, it's not inherently obvious when you pick up a, a chunk of flint you can't just start hitting it with a rock and, and knocking flakes off and making something. You have to be taught how to do it. You need to know the right angles. You need to know where exactly to hit it, how to prepare it. And so this is something that was taught from one generation to the next. So it is essentially our oldest detectable form of culture, our oldest taught behavior. It is language. And if you learn to read the rocks and you learn to understand these different technologies, you can decipher these essentially ancient languages, uh, metaphorically speaking. So what we're looking at here are called hand axes because as the name implies, they're made to be held in the hand. These were wielded implements used for chopping, scraping. Uh, this was the Swiss army knife 
uh, of, of what's called the early Paleolithic or the lower Paleolithic period. It is the most stable technology ever invented by humans. It lasts for nearly a million years without changing. And you just think about how much technological change we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years from, from computers with one megabyte of hard drive space to, to terabytes of hard drive space now. And, and um, those of us who have lived across the, the, the age of the internet, from pre-internet to post-internet, from pre-smartphones to post-smartphones. So we've seen a number of, of technological revolutions in this one lifetime. And yet in the past, for over a million years, this was it. This was all people did. So we find these all over the landscapes in, in Southern Oman. And just to give you a, a quick idea of how they were made, you'd start with a chunk of, of flint, a chunk of raw material, this raw cobble, and you hit it with what's called a hammer stone. And it can be very simple in this case, where just three, four flakes have been knocked off, or slightly more elaborate in this case, where they've created an entire edge. But in almost every case, they're teardrop shaped, uh, called cordiform, and um, they, it, 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 this goes from, from Africa to Asia to Europe, wherever we are in the world for over a million years, this is what we find. So moving on to the next period, it's called the Middle Paleolithic, and this is when modern humans show up onto the scene. There is a leap in complexity around this time, and we go from making these simple handheld tools to tools that are, are composite, that consist of multiple parts. And in this case, what we find all over, all over Arabian Peninsula, in particular Oman, are spear points made in a very particular way, which we'll talk about later. Now, these would have been put on, these could have been knives or hafted. Hafting is the act of securing it onto a shaft. And so these could have been hafted or attached onto the end of, of the, an elongated shaft and used for hunting. We're getting better at hunting. We're getting better at cooperative behavior, at social behavior. We're getting better at creating more elaborate tools. Now, to create these more elaborate tools, you have to see multiple steps ahead. So in that case of this, this hand axe, well, they've got a shape in their minds, and they hit it a few times, and they create that shape. It's, it's really a very simple process. I say simple, but if you asked me to do it, I'd probably be hard pressed to, to make one of those stone tools. And certainly by the time we get to the middle Paleolithic, there's no way I can make these spear points because they are so complex. Uh, they, they require so much skill to make. And um, we'll, we'll come back to these later. In the upper Paleolithic, which is something we don't find a lot of in Oman. And again, I'll talk about this on why we don't find much of this later. Um, later on, but we do find some of it. And they're getting more complex. Now they're creating wood carving equipment, uh, equipment to, to perforate leather, to whittle structures, to create architectural structures, to make clothing, to make ornamental beads, uh, and, and more elaborate hunting equipment. So it's another window into just using, looking at their tools, looking at the byproducts of, of their tools and, and of the stone, it's a window into their ever increasing social complexity and, and technological uh, complexity. Now, by the time we get to the Neolithic, Neolithic means new stone age. And now they're producing their own food. They're herding animals, herding cattle. So on the left is the hand axe I showed you earlier from a quarter million years ago. And on the right is this beautiful, absolutely stunning Neolithic knife that we found. Now, the great thing about this picture is we found these two artifacts about 100 meters apart. So while things do change quite a bit, they don't change that much um, in, in terms of the medium of using stone. They just become much, much better at fashioning stone equipment. So this is probably the, the one piece on the right is one of the most gorgeous pieces we found out in the field. And it just goes to, it gives you a sense of how much control they had gained over making these artifacts. Now, everything I've just shown you, we find in some cases all next to each other. So they're going to these, these flint factory sites, manufacturing flint, leaving the, the garbage behind and returning thousands and thousands of years later. In some cases, different species 
are, are using these sites. Now, this is the same raw material. That's the other thing uh, I want to point out with this picture. This is flint. But on the right side, the flint has been on the surface for maybe 8,000 years, 9,000 years. So time hasn't really affected it too badly. The wind hasn't, hasn't scoured it, chemicals haven't broken it down. But on the left, it's been lying out on the surface for at least a quarter of a million years, if not half a million years. So um, the, the various uh, minerals in, in the sediment have broken down the surface, the silicate surface of the flint and, and um, the evidence speaks for itself. You can see what, what time has done to that piece. So changing gears for a minute, now that you have a, a rough idea of the, at least the scope of what we're finding and the scope of human prehistory in the deserts of Oman, um, I'd like to talk about why this is important. What does this tell us about human origins, modern human origins? So if I can just set the scene in the late 90s, and this is when I started getting into um, human prehistory of Southern Arabia when I became interested in this region. The late 90s, we had just, scientists, geneticists had just cracked open the human genome and had deciphered uh, our, our past. So in, in looking at the human genome, one of the, one of the abilities this gives us is tracing different population histories, looking at the, the genetic history of our species. And the, the great revelation, which was something that had been suspected up until that point, but we didn't know for sure, and it was, it was the subject of fierce debates, was where do we come from? Do we come from one, when I say we, I'm talking about modern humans, anatomically modern humans, homo sapiens, us, the, the species that looked like us, that I wouldn't say acted like us because we weren't culturally advanced yet, um, but we had the hardware in place. We had the same brain case, the same facial structure, the same body, limb proportions. What we discovered is that sometime before 100,000 years ago, we were a single homogenous population somewhere in Africa. Now this has changed quite a bit in the last 20 years, but at the time it was, it was thought it was somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. And then sometime after 100,000 years ago, we left. One group left Africa and replaced everyone else on Earth. So there, there are several different species that were, that were around at the time. There's Neanderthals. There's a species called Denisovans that live in Asia. There's a species called Homo floresiensis that lives in Indonesia. In fact, there was just another Indonesian species that was announced a couple months ago. Um, there's another mysterious species that lived in Africa. So this is a world of not just modern humans, but all kinds of different variants of what we call hominids, things that are like humans, but, but are somewhat genetically different than us. And we replaced all of them. We assimilate all of them, we replace all of them. And by say about 12,000 years ago, we have expanded as you, you can just look at these dates and you can track the expansion of humans as they leave Africa 100,000 years ago. They're in South Asia by 70. They cross over into North America by 15,000 years ago. And this is actually out of date because now we know that they crossed about 25,000 years ago. Uh, but they had, and they've gotten to Australia by 50,000. So they've, they've taken over the globe. They've gone into places that no one else has gone before through their ingenuity, through their creativity and their behavioral flexibility. And what I was most interested in is well, what about that first great leap out of Africa? Why did we leave Africa? Who left Africa? Where do they leave from and when did they leave? So the genetics were giving us some picture of what happens, but we didn't have any archeological evidence. And 20 years ago, no one had really looked at human prehistory in, in Oman. And in fact, when I started working here, the big debate was, what, were there early humans? And there were a lot of people that thought, well, there is no early human occupation in Oman. And um, and it was simply because they hadn't been out in the deserts looking in the right places. So what I was curious about, if you look at just going back and looking at this map, what's missing is an arrow going through Southern Arabia. Uh, it, we can see we have a land bridge that goes across Sinai into the Levant. But in Southern Arabia, we have this area called the Bab al-Mandab Strait. Now, it's not a land bridge. It was never a land bridge. Uh, not in the last three million years, it was not a land bridge. But it's about 
depending on the sea levels, which are rising up and down, up and down um, over the course of different ice ages, depending on the sea level, it's between about four kilometers and 30 kilometers across, which means at certain points you could swim across it in an afternoon. This is this, this period here, this, this little area here, the southern part of the Red Sea, between it separates Yemen and Djibouti. And there's an island in the middle called Param Island. And what, what I find so intriguing about this place is that you can see across it, which means that for tens, hundreds of thousands of years, there were hominids living in Djibouti, living in this area of the Horde of Africa and looking across the Red Sea. And somebody had to have been scratching their heads going, well, what's over there? Where's the sun coming from? Where's, what are these mountains that the sun is coming up over? And at this point, we didn't have any complex seafaring abilities. And this is an, a big question that we were trying to work out. What is the seafaring capacity of early humans? Could they cross the, the Baba Mandak? And some people thought they could. Some people thought, well, uh, there was a big theory that was the, the real um, a popular theory when I started working in Southern Oman, that humans had sailed across, navigated across, sail, not sailing, but navigated across the Red Sea, and they had learned how to fish. They had learned how to, it's called beachcombing. They learned how to, how to extract shellfish and live off of shellfish. And that had opened up this brand new ecosystem. So they went marching out of Africa, spread quickly across Southern Arabia into South Asia. And then eventually by 50,000 years ago, they had spread into Australia. So this was a, an interesting theory. We didn't have any evidence to back it up, but it was a theory that could be tested. And so when I started working in, in Amman, and I'd actually done a, a bit of work out in the plateau, but in 2010, I thought it's time to test this, this um, coastal oasis, uh, sorry, this, this coastal expansion hypothesis. And so we, we found this, this cave. If anyone, if you guys, anyone's been down to Dofar, this is just above Wadi Darbat, which is one of the most spectacular, stunning Wadi systems in all of, all of Dofar region. There, this is a waterfall, which you can sort of make out just here. This, this drops to about 100 meters below, and it runs during the monsoon season. So we're about, in this picture, we're about three kilometers from the coast. You have flowing water going through the wadi. You have a flint source that's just down here at the base of this cave entrance. You have this massive cave where you can park a, a whole fleet of cars inside. And you have sediment, which is not so easy to find in, in Oman. This is one of our, our biggest challenges. Is sites are everywhere on the surface, as, as I showed you a few minutes ago. But finding sites that are buried is a big challenge. And this cave had buried uh, sediments. It had a deep sequence, at least 10 meters thick of, of sediments. So in 2010, I was teaching at a university in, in the UK. And I got a research grant to come to, to this cave and to excavate it. And we thought this was going to rewrite human history, human prehistory. We took this picture uh, for posterity because we thought this is the groundbreaking of, of the big cave. And this is we're just about to, to open up uh, and learn all the secrets of, of human origins from this one spot. Three weeks later, we had excavated 12 cubic meters to over three meters depth, um, getting as deep as we could, and we found zero artifacts. And the, 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 this is by my colleague, Dr. Vitaly Usyk. He's from Ukraine, and you can see the look on his face. I think at this point, they were about to put me in one of these holes. Uh, we were really facing despair. Um, I had a graduate student at the time who was doing, was supposed to be doing his PhD on this cave. And so he was miserable uh, thinking, I've got absolutely nothing to write about, nothing to, to. So we decided, okay, we'll shift gears and we will, instead of putting all our money into this one cave, uh, which clearly isn't going to answer our questions, we'll look along the, the whole coastal plain area. So surely, knowing what we knew about all of the different artifacts that we could find in the interior deserts, surely we could find something either. So here is Salala down here. Here we looked at all of these, these um, in the canyons on the top of the plateau, uh, at the edge of the plateau on the north. And in every one of these uh, red diamonds, we found nothing. That's what a null site indicates, nothing. 
So now we are two months into the into the season. This is about the end of March 2010. And we're in a panic and I, I've, the grant was for three years and I'm thinking, how do I go home and justify finding nothing, zilch, for my entire first year of research? So as is the case always in archeology, span you find the best stuff on the last day. So on the, on the second to last day here, we, we, I had sent the rest of the team back down to, to the camp in Salala and Vitaly and I stayed up on the plateau and we went to the last place to look on our list, which was out on the western side of the plateau, close to the Yemeni border, a site called Wadi Aibut. And it was there, there's this, I don't know if you can, you can make it out, but there's this very shallow gully that's running through across this terrace and emptying into a wadi over here. And all on this surface, there are these typical workshop type artifacts, but what we found were we found about six of these on the very first day and they're they're dirty covered in dust we brought them back to to the camp and we're that night over dinner we're cleaning everything having a look at it and we so we go huh now this is something different i haven't seen this before now keeping in mind i mean this was the first year of of my research uh to look to test this coastal expansion hypothesis, but I had been looking for eight years in Oman and 10 years, uh, if you count Yemen. Um, so I had been, been looking in Southern Arabia. I had never seen anything like this before. And it's a very specific kind of technology called Nubian cores, Nubian uh, techno complex is the official name. And it had never been found outside of Africa until this day. Now, six artifacts doesn't really tell you all that much. You need, you need more. Um, with stone tools, you have to look at the complete assemblage, the, the, the whole collection of, of manufacturing waste products to be able to start putting together the sequence of what they were doing there. But this was enough. This one artifact was enough to pique our curiosity. So we went back the next day. We canceled the cleaning up. Thought, oh, we'll just expend, extend the field season another couple of days. And within an hour, we had collected 100 of these almost identical technologies. And as I said, I'd never seen anything like it. Nobody had ever seen anything like this in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, what we're looking at is not the, all of these are waste products. This is not the tool. This is not the tool. The tool is what's not here. The tool is this negative scar, is this pointed piece. I showed you earlier those spear points from the middle Paleolithic. That's what these what they were doing. That's what they were making here. They were making spear points. So the way this technology works is this gray part is the actual core. This white bit is what they would have knocked off the top of the core. And so there's th th this elaborate shaping process just to get to that, which is then put onto the end of a, a shaft. Now, as I said earlier, stone tool technology is language how they went about making these stone tools tells us who they were. And this had never been found outside of Africa. Now, they were dated in Africa to about 100,000 years ago. We were lucky enough that we found one actually embedded in, the, in this gully, in, the, in this little bit of a, a concreted river sediment that had built up on, on the, the side of it. So you can see this piece is totally different. It's white and it's the same material, but it's been, because it's been buried under the ground, it's been um, altered over the years by, by chemical processes and weathered, but it's the same technology, same type of artifact. And we were able to date that, we, we dated those sediments. And if you wanna talk about how we dated these, we can, we can deal with this in the, in the Q and A session afterward. Um, so we were able to date the sediments in which it was embedded and they came back between 115 and 97,000 years ago, which was incredible because this was everything matched up. The date matched the date of the sites in Africa. The technology matched these same technologies in Africa. And over the course of the next uh, several years, we mapped over 250 of these sites all across the plateau from the Yemeni border to uh, Marmoul, which is the, the, the town on the easternmost side of this, of this plateau in Dofar. 
And it's interesting that the dirty secret of archaeology, you find what you're looking for. So I had been looking for 10 years and I'd never seen one of these. And as soon as we knew what we were looking for, and as soon as we knew the right landscapes to target, not a day went by in the field where we didn't find at least one Nubian site. Still, unfortunately, only that one buried site, but, but the rest are on the surface and it's the same technology every time. Now, the big, biggest surprise um, of all, First of all, these are a bit older than we were expecting. At the time, uh, in 2010, most people thought humans didn't leave Africa until 60,000 years ago. And we were dating ours to 100,000 years ago. And what also made it interesting is we didn't come from sub-Saharan Africa. These don't resemble uh, stone tools from sub-Saharan Africa. They resemble stone tools from the Nile Valley. And this was and still is one of the biggest surprises. And I think one of the points that are, to this day is missed by a lot of people when we talk about the emergence of humans. We are a nilotic species. This is where we began. This is where we certainly began to make these kind of stone tools culturally. This is where, where the guys that left Africa, the specific population that left Africa, this was their starting point. And what we're looking at with these blue dots are places where we've where we found uh, Nubian complex sites, Nubian sites. Now I use the word Nubia. This has absolutely nothing to do with modern Nubia. It just has to do with archaeological naming conventions. So we, we, we call things from the first place they're found, the first place they're discovered. So in this case, uh, they were found in the 1960s in in the during the Nubian monuments campaign in southern Egypt when they were building the uh, the Great Aswan Dam. So they they just got that name of, of the region, but but I don't want you to, to mislead you into thinking that this has a connection to modern day Nubia. And these sites in Yemen were reported after we found our cluster here. Uh, this site in northern Oman was found a couple of years ago. These sites in Saudi were found a couple of years ago. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they found a, a, some Nubian sites in the southern Levant in a place called Demona in the Negev Desert. So the story that I'm telling now is very much ongoing. It's something that is in, unfolding in real time as we continue to, to learn about this, this first chapter in the history of our species. So if, just to summarize, this giant blob, and probably not completely accurate, but this giant blob is essentially the homeland of the first humans. And we talk about leaving Africa, and I think that in itself is problematic. There wasn't a, an expansion out of Africa that happened during a single moment in time. There is a connection between two populations, some that live in Northeast Africa, some that live in the Arabian Peninsula. There's gene flow all across the Arabian Peninsula during the wet period. So from about 125,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago, which is 50,000 years. That's a massive span of time. So during that span of time, there are people crossing back and forth, back and forth, and it goes in both directions. But we're, we're so uh, stuck in, in thinking about, when I say we, anthropologists, archeologists tend to get stuck in thinking of Africa and thinking of humans leaving Africa as this one way arrow. But in fact, it's a much more complex process of going back and forth and, and as the climate dynamics, dynamics shifted between regions, one place, was, a, was better to live during certain times and another place was better to live at other times. So this is our giant homeland. And then after 70,000 years ago, Arabia turns back to desert and we can't live in the interior anymore. So we contracted into what are called refugia. These are refuge. This is places where we can survive. Uh, one of them is the Gulf Basin. In the Gulf Basin, we can survive because what I'm showing you here, this, this yellow area is what is now underwater, but is only about 40 meters deep. And the sea levels were 120 meters lower at this time, up to 120 meters lower. So this is all dry land. The Gulf, for the majority of the history of our species, was dry land. And it's dry land that is also lowland. So it's marshes, there's fresh water. The word Bahrain is, is, means ocean, but it's in the dual form. It means the double ocean because it's referring to the fresh water that's beneath. So you have the salt water on top and all this fresh water that's stored beneath Bahrain. There's fresh water springs. There are travel 
accounts of Portuguese explorers that went to Bahrain in the 1600s and they paid locals to swim down and refill their canteens from the fresh water that is that is seeping up underneath the, the seabed uh, from the seabed. So it, 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 this is an entirely separate story that I, I uh, could do a whole another lecture on. I call it the Gulf Oasis. Suffice to say, this is one of the, the ancestral homelands where we would have contracted into and been able to survive when the rest of Arabia turned dry. Uh, we have the Red Sea Basin over here and we have Dofar. And why was Dofar a refugium? Because look at it today, because this is where the water is. And it really is a simple equation where there's water, there's life, there are humans. And what we've learned is that this is where we, we contracted, this is where we survived. And it, it was a big question mark. We had this was a theory I had put out that humans didn't die out in the Arabian Peninsula. They survived and they, they contracted into these places. And then uh, last year, we announced the discovery of a, of a brand new site called Matifa, which is in the Wadi Gadun, which is, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dofar, it's, it's about an hour, uh, two hours north of Salala. If you're, if you're driving from the coast, you go up to the north and you drive west. And this is one of the biggest wadis, uh, one of the biggest dry wadis on the plateau. And what we found just by sheer luck uh, was turning off of the, the main wadi system here. We found this little tributary with these preserved sediments. And remember what I said earlier, sediments are the hardest thing in the world to find in Oman. And, and we could tell when we first saw them that this was, this was something special. And we began digging down and we found these, these artifacts uh, that were something that had never, again, had never been found before in the Arabian Peninsula uh, called microliths. It's a very specific kind of technology associated with the invention of the bow and arrow. And remember the, 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 the night we found this site, we, we were completely confused, perplexed. How, we had no idea how old the site could be. And I remember we were all sitting around betting, you know, 12,000, 16,000, I think somebody might have said 18,000 and we all laughed at them. And then we got the dates back and it was 35, between 35 and 28,000 years ago. Why is this significant? Because this is the height of the last ice age. So the climate begins to go downhill after 70,000 years ago, but it really becomes horrible between say about 30 and 20,000 years ago, the height of the last ice age. This is when this is when we thought all life had, had disappeared from the Arabian Peninsula. And yet here are these hunter gatherers that had invented microliths, invented the, the hurled projectile and survived by using their, their creative flexibility, by using their, their adaptive behavior, by, by um, inventing something new. So these might not look like much, uh, and they're, they're the tiny, really hard to find. They're, they're about three centimeters long and about uh, five millimeters wide. Uh, so re really small pieces. And they would not have been single. They would have been part of a composite tool. And so I'm just showing you, that, um, this is not something we found in Dafar, but this is just an example of, of what something like this would have looked like, like a harpoon, a composite weapon that was either um, shot like a bow and arrow or hurled. This is called the, the person at the this cartoon at the top is, is demonstrating that. It's called an atlatl. An atlatl, it, it's the term for it in North America. In Australia, they're called woomeron. And they use a lever to, to hurl this thing at high velocities. And the reason you would need something like this is because you no longer have herds of wild cattle or, or uh, giant bison or giant elephants to eat anymore. The main food sources are gone. So now you've got to, to come up with a, a new way of hunting smaller things like gazelle, smaller and faster, gazelle, spiny tailed lizard. And, um, and in the center here is ostrich. Ostrich was common throughout South Arabia until the early 20th century with the introduction of the rifle. And as soon as rifles were introduced, the ostrich became extinct. Uh, but this was a major food source for, for hunter-gatherers during the last ice age. And so what we've been able to determine is that 
at least in, in parts of Dofar, people survived. Now, this is the only site in the Arabian Peninsula from this time period. We don't know of any other human habitation during the last ice age, except this one place. That's not to say they're not there, uh, but, but we haven't been able to find them yet. And part of that might be archeological visibility. When there's few people, there are few people making garbage to leave behind for us archeologists to find. So when there's lots of people, there's lots of garbage. And now I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my talk, but I, I, I think it's important to, to, to explain what happened to everybody. And the, the next period of time after this, this, this period, the, 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 the upper Paleolithic, is the epipaleolithic. And epi means above. So this means above the old stone age, the period just after the old stone age. So it's this, it's this interesting period of transition that occurs between 12,000 years ago and 8,000 years ago, when the world comes out of the last ice age and it's about to go into one of these green periods again. It's also a period of, of rapid social change we're we're beginning now our population numbers are going up there's more food uh, the the environment has become so much more friendly and so much more conducive to supporting large populations so as our numbers are, are rising uh, we have to become more adept at feeding everybody so we begin to see the first stirrings of food production in, in the northern part of, uh, of the middle east in the, what's called the fertile crescent we see the origins of agriculture. In the southern part, we see the, the origins of, of animal domestication, of cattle herding and goat herding. Now, I was, I was giving a talk. I had found a site um, that was anonymously, anomin, anomalously old in Dofar. It was about 12,000 years old, which was a few thousand years older than we ever expected to find anything there from the Neolithic period, from the Epipolithic period. And I was giving a talk, this is about 10 years ago, at Sultan Qaboos University, and trying to explain that we didn't understand what these results meant and why were there people in Dofar at such an early date and still coming to terms with uh, all of the, everything I presented in this talk, we hadn't discovered yet. So we're still coming to terms with trying to understand how this all worked. And I get to the end and somebody says, well, have you done any genetic testing? And I said, well, you know, no, we were having trouble getting our permits to, to look at that. And somebody, this very kindly, soft-spoken gentleman at the back of the room stands up and he introduces himself. He says, I'm Professor Riyad Bayoumi. I am uh, the Dean of the College of Medicine. And actually, uh, I have done the genetic testing. And that's why I came to your talk tonight, because I don't understand my results. And I was hoping that your archaeology might help shed light on our genetics. And it, it was this beautiful moment, this coming together of two different fields, different research agendas, and learning from one another. And what Riyadh had discovered is that lactase persistence, the ability to digest milk, which is something that is not inherent in, in all humans. It's not something that's part of, of the human package. This is something we, this is a mutation. This is something that, that we developed when we began to domesticate cattle and we began to drink milk on a regular basis. Uh, before about 8,000 years ago, we could not digest milk after the age of four. There's an allele, there's a, there's a gene that shuts down milk production after, about, after, after infancy. That allele broke that gene broke and mutated. And for some people, they could drink you know, all the milk they wanted for, for the rest of their lives. And this was so incredibly beneficial that it spread rapidly through the population. And, and, um, and here we are today with, with all our milk products and, and surviving off of dairy. Now imagine as well, this is the Arabian Peninsula. This is, this is a place that was soon to become dry. So not only do you have food, but you have liquid. You have a, a, essentially a, a source of, of both calories, of protein, and of, of, of hydration that, you can, you can, that will follow you around. Um, so, so this was the impetus for cattle domestication. What they discovered 
was there, there are five different mutations around the world. Everybody, most people in the Middle East have what's called 13915, which, which is a, the specific, specific location of this gene. And what the team found, which they had not known before, was that it seems to originate in Dofar. So the story, the plot thickens. Now we have a population that survived in Dofar, that, that um, spread out. I neglected to point out with all of these dots. I was so excited to tell the, the lactase persistence story. I forgot to, to explain these dots. These are archaeological sites. There are, there are over, over 700 of these from the Epipaleolithic. So this, this seed of a, of a small population that survived during the last ice age blows up and expands across the entire peninsula. Uh, so the entire southern part of the Canyonlands by, by between 12 and 8,000 years ago. And they had begun to experiment with animal domestication. Perhaps these were the people that first domesticated cattle. Now, what happened to, to everybody? And, and unfortunately, the, the, the story has a sad ending. Um, at the same time that I was not just me, but all of the research teams in Arabia were, were making these, these really startling and unexpected discoveries about early humans in the peninsula. There was a team of geneticists from Harvard looking at ancient DNA from all over the world. And in 2016, they discovered what's called a ghost population, a population of modern humans that no longer exist, that have been wiped clean from the, the genetic record. Now we have certain markers. so. Uh, we still find um, fragments of their DNA in modern populations in all throughout the peninsula, all throughout Iran, um, some of it in South Asia, but the actual population has disappeared. So I'm showing you three slices of time. This is 45 to 35,000 years ago at the top. And people speculate that the basal Eurasians were here, not only in the Arabian Peninsula, but specifically associated with the Gulf Oasis. This is speculative we have not found a single shred of ancient DNA, not a single shred of skeletal evidence from this time period in the Arabian Peninsula. So this is one of the great questions that still needs to be answered. Between 34 and 15,000 years ago, they're still here. They're hanging on. And then sometime after seven and a half thousand years ago, they're gone. They have been completely erased. And what makes the basal Eurasians so interesting, they are what we can tell from the DNA, they are the oldest modern human population that left Africa. They're the only modern human population. So if you look at all these other blotches across the map, these are modern human populations that interbred with different species, with Neanderthals in, in Europe and with a group called Denisovans in Asia. And then here are our basal Eurasians that never interbred. They remained isolated within the Arabian Peninsula for tens of thousands of years and then disappeared. Where did they go and what happened to them? We don't know. What we, we do know is that between, so what I'm showing you here on this climate map is this is 8,000 years ago and this is 4,000 years ago. So between around 8,000 and 5,000 years, there were these long mega droughts as the, this wet period that had been going on for, for quite a while came to an end, Arabia began to dry out. The monsoon, which had been dro dropping its rainfall all across the Rubal Kali, all across the interior of the peninsula, moved south to where it is today. And in doing so, it triggers these droughts. So we can tell from these lakes that dry out. We can, we can even tell from the stalactites that are dripping from the cave ceiling. So here, uh, this bottom signal is from Hoti Cave, which is a, a major cave system in Northern Oman. And we've analyzed, uh, scientists have analyzed the stalactites that are, that are hanging from the ceiling and they can look at in very high resolution detail when it's wet, when it's dry, when are the stalactites forming, when are they drying out? What they've been able to identify are at least four droughts and one of them, which lasts from about 5,900 to 5,400 or 5,300 years ago. And that's 600 years of no rainfall. And this coincides with an archeological phase called the dark millennium, when the Neolithic ends, when there are no more archeological sites. There is one archeological site from this entire period 
And it's actually found here in, in Muscat, in Corum, in Corum Heights. Um, but it's the only site. For the most part, this, 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 is, the, this is the end of, of the Neolithic population. Now, there are people who survive. They survive along the coast. They become fishermen. And, and they herald the, 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 the historic period of, of Omani history. But those cattle herders from the interior that, that, were, that were living in the Canyonlands are gone. And that's the end of their story. And on my, my very last slide, uh, leading into the discussion section, I just thought I'd have a little bit of fun. And, and I couldn't resist uh, throwing in a bit of folklore, a bit of oral tradition, and a bit of mythology, because this is traditionally in the Quran, in the Arabian Nights, and, and in, in different um, um, orally transmitted in the Hadith, there are, are references to a land called al -Ahqaf. There's a whole chapter of the Quran called al -Ahqaf, which refers to, which literally means the, the, the crescent-shaped dunes, the sand dunes, the shifting sandy plains. And al -Ahqaf is a legendary place that was once filled with gardens and with springs and flowing water and was occupied by a mythological people called the Ad, Ad. And the people of Ad are the oldest, uh, are said to have been the oldest people of the Arabian Peninsula who were, were wiped out by, 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 by uh, desertification, by a dust storm. And interestingly, this is the part that really got me scratching my head, is the Quran makes a specific reference to them being cattle herders. It says they are blessed with cattle and with children, with, with swelling population numbers and with cows. And so what I would argue, and, and I've, I've just written a book about this, is that um, this is actually a, 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 a relic of an oral tradition that refers to the Neolithic period of Arabia, that refers to this, this population that had once been so prosperous in the interior and then had, had eventually died out. So on that note, I um, finished my story and um, hopefully we could have a, a bit of a, oh, sorry, <laughs> one, one more point. Uh, this is al -Aqqaf. The reason I'm showing you this map is because it's on the maps in the eastern part of Yemen, in the southern part of Oman. So it's not just a, a, a simply a, a, um, a rough idea, but it was something that was accepted um, by cartographers up until I think the last time it appears on a map is 1921. So for, for three, 400 years, this area is specifically known as al -Aqqa. And that does it for me. And I, um, if I can figure out how to turn off screen sharing, I can turn it over to Dr. Saeed. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Thank you very much for this you know, interesting journey and uh, for this you know, very promising um, uh, presentation compared to what I mentioned before about uh, Yuval Harari. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you give us you give us more hope here that you know we had some sort of uh, civilization prehistory, and we had some technology, and um, uh, there are some you know very few questions from our audience. Uh, one of them is um, you know it's a funny question, but uh, I don't know. I mean people sometimes think you know differently when when they listen to this kind of historical talks. It's it asks about you know really uh, how long to go until we get we go green again. That's a great question. That's a, it's a really great question. Um, it's, so in 1950, we entered, in 1950 is a rough date, but we entered a period called the Anthropocene, which mm -hmm. means that we left the period of nature-based climate change, of, of, of the earth going through its natural cycles, and we began to create our own, inadvertently, accidentally, we began to create our own um, climatic cycles. So it's hard question to answer because we have disrupted the, the Earth systems. We, through de deforestation, through uh, the, the release of, of CO2 into the atmosphere through global warming, we are now um, getting close to uh, getting close to the, the, the we're, two degrees increase of two degrees Celsius, which is where we were 125,000 years ago. And unfortunately, without the, the increased rainfall, because we've, we've did, for that to happen, you need vegetation, you need um, the forests of Dofar to grow. 
you need the lands in the in the grasslands. So if we can we can make Arabia green again if we wanted to, and this is something that that um, uh, we, we've been talking about on the side with MCBS. Um, we can make Arabia green again intentionally by planting more trees, by growing the grasslands, by increasing agricultural production through all kinds of new methods of, of water extraction. And by doing that, by cooling off the land surface of the Arabian Peninsula, you can draw the monsoon into further into the interior. So as I said in the beginning of my talk, there's this temperature gradient, the hot air coming off of the desert, coming into contact with the cool air off of the, the ocean. And that's what creates the monsoon. So if you cooled off the desert by, by growing things in it, then we can lure the monsoon back. Um, so my answer to that would be, it's up to us. Interesting, interesting. Now, Jeff, um, what about uh, the you know geography of uh, wadis in Oman now? Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have now some sort of you know really maps, you know, and surveys carried out by the government to identify all wadis in the country now. Uh, to what extent the existing wadis in Oman uh, uh, similar or existed? I mean, during the period you are talking about. I think that as you um, as you get closer to the mountain ranges, those wadis, so all the wadis that we see today would have been rivers. And the magnitude of those rivers and how much of the year they were filled with water would depend on how close they are to the mountain ranges. So that, because the mountain ranges are what's stopping up the moisture, what's stopping the humidity and what's creating the rainfall. So Dofar, the Nedj Plateau, is probably the, the epicenter of all of this because it's so close to the modern extent of the, of, of the rainfall zone, the, the Kharif today. And it's also, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's the second you have a, uh, a, the, the slightest increase in, in, in the monsoon, the slightest intensification of the monsoon, the first place that's affected is the far, is the Nedj Plateau. And, and eventually, soon after uh, Yemen, Hadjimaut, the area that's called Mahra, which is the eastern part of Yemen. Um, and so these wadis, for any archaeological period, are, are a map to finding the sites. And then this is the one, um, what makes my job so easy working in Oman is that people need to be near water. And so when you have an arid landscape, all you have to do is go to the water source and you find the archaeological sites. So this is a roadmap to find all the archaeological sites. And in fact, I had a student um, who was using satellite imagery and creating um, a, a predictive model for how to find archaeological sites based simply on where's their flint and where's their wadi. And when you, and if you, and it, it is that simple. Um, and he was able to come up to about 85% accuracy in terms of, of predicting where are we going to find at least something on the surface. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Now, a related question is about you know um, uh, urban planning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is this is a big issue now in Oman, and uh, some people talk about you know really we are invading you know wadis, okay, and these areas were like you know almost you know sacred areas in the past. Our ancestors. Yeah use them really to build far away from, you know, uh, the, you know, tracks of the wadis themselves. But now we feel like, you know, really we are going into the wadis themselves. And uh, what lessons we can learn from the, you know, history for Arab, play, uh, Arab planning? That is such a good question. I, I, I thank whoever asked that because this is, I think, one of the, the biggest challenges that, that faces uh, Oman today, but also uh, potentially um, one of its biggest assets is how do we manage this heritage? What do we do about these these sites? Because they're everywhere. The scale of these sites is is astronomical, and and how can you develop which has to be done, but at the same time save these archaeological sites? And and it's um, I don't have a clear answer. Uh, because there is really no clear answer. I, I've done a lot of consulting work for oil companies, for instance, where um, 
they do environmental management. So I'll be hired to, if there's a pipeline going in or if they're, they're doing seismic work to find new reservoirs, they'll need to send in a team of environmental managers and heritage managers to explore and to record baseline conditions. What are the animals, what are the plants, and what is the archeology span in the zone? And so that we can avoid destroying it. And unfortunately, I've seen through mining activities, I've seen the devastation of archeological sites on the Nedge Plateau, um, simply because it's hard to recognize these sites. If you don't know what you're looking for, these landscapes of Flint just look like rock, sharp rock. And so I, um, I've seen them disappear. And we have to be very careful and especially on the Nedge Plateau, which is the, I think, not just Omani heritage, but this is global heritage. This is the, the this is the last place on earth where we were a single tribe, where we, we were together as we left Africa, as our species migrated out and moved through Southern Arabia. This is the last place where we were, where pretty much anyone living outside of Africa could say, my ancestor lived here. My ancestor made this tool, made this artifact. So, so we need to be very careful about preserving these sites, um, whether it's because of road development or oil infrastructure development or quarrying activity or, or anything. Um, but in some cases, they can be used, they can be incorporated into the design. So I know that in Dukum, for instance, there's a type, this is from the later period, from the Iron Age, but there's a type of archaeological site called a trilith. And they have been actually preserving these and, and building museums around them and using this, the work in Dukum as an opportunity to make sure that these sites are protected. So um, this is, this is I, I wish I could give a, a clearer answer, but this is the challenge that, that I think faces the next generation in Oman and, um, and should be taken very seriously. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Uh, there is a very interesting question since you made the reference I mean to Quran and Hadith uh, some audience here asking about uh, uh, a question that uh, there is mentioned in some of our holy scriptures that uh, Adam and Eve met in uh, Arafah okay and Arafah was called Arafah because you know they knew each other there okay in, uh, in the you know middle of uh, Arab Peninsula okay now uh, some some scriptures say also that you know Adam came from Sri Lanka, okay, and meet you know him there. Now this idea of you know really concentrating on uh, Arab Peninsula, I think it is it sounds consistent with this kind of you know really uh, scenario of Adam you know the first human being who what we believe according to Quran that you know really he was there, and uh, but uh, coming from Sri Lanka. Some other books talk about, you know, he was there and came here. So how do you find that uh, related to your talk? Um, it, it's, it's one of my favorite subjects is, is how do we put together mythology, oral tradition, um, sacred scriptures and the archaeological evidence. And it's not straightforward. And there really is, is um, no clear way of doing it because we we can look at the, the, the scriptures as being inspired by real events, um, but it, it's very difficult to use it as a roadmap to deciphering uh, scientific events. Uh, so whether it's through genetics or whether it's through archeology. span Having said that, um, I would sort of ask the question, well, who is Adam? Who is Eve? What are we talking about? These are concepts. These are, these are it, it, when, when, when you translate over to science, these are concepts. So um, is Adam, when we do DNA, we talk about Y chromosome, which is the male lineage. We talk about mitochondrial DNA, which represents the female lineage. So does Adam represent the, the, the Y chromosome lineage of, of uh, modern humans and Eve the, the mitochondrial lineage? And if so, um, how, where can we trace these back to? And I'm leading up to saying, we don't know because we have no DNA from the Arabian Peninsula. We have no <laughs> skeletal evidence from the Arabian Peninsula. So I'm gonna turn, take this question and turn it on its head and, and issue the challenge to, to anybody who's, who's watching this, who's an aspiring archeologist, that there is so much more work that needs to be done. There is exactly. so much more investigation that um, there are skeletons out there I don't know where to find them. I've been looking for 20 years. I don't know where they are. 
there's DNA, ancient DNA preserved in maybe some Bronze Age tombs, maybe some Neolithic graveyards that can be extracted. And so that is, again, I'm putting this on the next generation. Yep, exactly. Now, there's a question about uh, the title of the book you mentioned, you wrote about uh, Al-Aqqaf and Ad. Uh, what the title of the book? Uh -huh. You mentioned while, while you were talking about... So this, uh, is, it's a, this, this is an introductory student textbook that um, it, it's, it's not quite done yet. The, the writing is done. I'm working on the illustrations now. It's called An Introduction to Human Prehistory in Arabia, the Lost World of the Southern Crescent. And what I mean by Southern Crescent, and this is a concept that, that I talk a lot about, uh, that, I, that I develop in the book. So there's this word, maybe some people are familiar with it, the Fertile Crescent. Um, this is this, this um, kind of crescent-shaped arc of land that stretches between the Levant and Mesopotamia. And we've, we've known and talked about and explored and investigated the, the, the Fertile Crescent for hundred years. This is where most archaeologists, this is Iraq and Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine. Uh, and it was believed that this is where civilization emerged. And what I argue in the book is that there's, that's the northern part of the crescent, but there's a southern crescent as well. And that's this land that stretches between Yemen and Oman and what's now underwater in the Gulf. This is what I call the Gulf Oasis. And, and to understand the, the history of our species, you have to put both crescents together. You need the Southern Crescent as well. So, so that's, that's the title of the book, and that's what I, what I, what I, the idea that I develop in the book. Great, great. Dr. Jeff Rose, I think this you know, really comes uh, to an end now. I've got some signals from our you know, organizer and director that really it's a uh, press time and we need to wrap up. So thank you okay. very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I think we have I mean, we have another talk, another you know, a webinar for some issues you raised and uh, put some other questions there. I think I'm going to post them to you, okay, for our audiences, and uh, we'll try maybe to include them in the you know, recording of this you know event. Thank you very much for being with us today uh, and giving us this very interesting talk about you know uh, uh, this you know part of the world. And I think uh, many Omani is very interested in, you know, to find out, you know, the uh, results of your, you know, uh, archaeological work, you know, uh, to come in the future. And um, thank you very much again. And uh, we would thank also to our uh, organizers behind the scene, you know, Mr. Ahmad and Saeed and Abdul Qawi, who are with us, you know, without being, you know, uh, uh, sharing this uh, discussion with us. So uh, I want to say just, uh, Thank you and uh, goodbye. We'll have another talk, uh, hopefully, about other issues related to this area. So, good day. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation and the Bye -bye. chance to talk about this. You're welcome.